So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Canadians for Chiropractic. Canadians for Chiropractic is a, a HANS Health Action Network Society initiative designed to educate Canadians about chiropractic and how it can enhance their well-being and to inform Canadians of chiropractic censorship, imposed limitations to practice, and the impacts on patients. And today I am delighted to bring you this presentation by Dr. Tom Preston. Dr. Tom Preston is a highly sought after trainer, advisor, consultant and coach who helps people be more so they can do more. For over 20 years, he has been helping people unleash their unlimited human potential to live the life of their dreams by assisting them in connecting to their most authentic version of self. Tom studied, whoops, sorry. Tom studied at the University of Toronto before receiving his Doctor of Chiropractic degree from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College in Toronto in 1988. Tom currently resides in North Bay, Ontario. Dr. Tom will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. And if you have a question, please, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, I give to you Dr. Tom Preston. Welcome. Thank you, Neda. It's a pleasure to be here. And this is a uh, cause very near and dear to my heart because chiropractic is uh, not only what I do, it's uh, quite representative of who I am. So I'm going to click a series of buttons here and uh, we should get to the right screen momentarily. Things go dark and go blight. And then uh, are we good to go, Neda? Just uh, before you depart, I want to be sure that I, my screen is actually being shown the way it's supposed to be. So it's perfect. That's perfect. All right. Well, again, listen, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy lives to be here, whether you're watching this live or on uh, recording. Um, as uh, Neda said, I have been uh, affiliated or associated with or have been in the chiropractic profession for um, quite a few years, actually, right? This is our 33rd year as a, as a licensed uh, doctor of chiropractic. Um, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth is when I graduated. And uh, I've had a chance to uh, Share my thoughts around the world. I've been speaking in uh, most of the continents on the planet uh, over the last uh, 30 plus years and uh, been a professional coach consultant on the industry for 25 years. So um, this is who I am. This is what I do. And it's a real honor to be able to be here and uh, share some ideas with you. So today, again, we're, we're going to talk about, you know, this concept of health and particularly how chiropractic fits into that concept of health. Um, and so one of the things that I think would be important, you know, right off the bat is to try and, you know, just figure out what it is that's, that's important in our lives, because is this concept of health even, is it even worth talking about? I mean, how important is it? You know, I've asked this question to a lot of different audiences when we travel the world and speak, and um, I've got a, a little a diagram here, a little hologram that we're going to design together that you can kind of follow along in your mind as I ask these questions as to, you know, what, what's important to you about your life and is health actually that important to you, right? So let me just click a series of buttons here because I commonly, when I ask this, people say, you know, I say, what's the most important thing in your life? And they go, well, my family's important to me. It's absolutely like mission critical for me. And I say, great, like my family's very important to me too. I've got five daughters. Uh, we just had our third grandchild six days ago. How am I old enough to have grandkids? I haven't got that figured out yet, but anyways, apparently I am. Um, so with this family, it's very, very important to me, but here's my question to you, to just for your reflection, if family's important to you. Can you really enjoy your family if you don't have your health? I mean, if you're in a hospital bed somewhere with tubes sticking out of every orifice in your body, can you really give your grandkids a hug or you know, interact with your family the way you want to? My offering is probably not, right? So, okay, well, there's other important things in life too, right? Like our career, many of us are very inspired and, and really feel fulfilled and feel like we're offering, you know, a great service to humanity through our careers. But again, relative to health, we try to put it in context here. Can you work when you don't feel well? Or even if, you know, if you're one of those like grinded out people that can go to work even when you feel crappy, I mean, can you be at your peak performance at work? Well, I would offer the answer is probably no. And so again, uh, career relative to health. Well, wait a second, maybe, maybe this health idea is you know, starting to look like it's a, it's a pretty important thing. Well, let people say, well, you know what? None of that this physical plane stuff matters. I'm just a spiritual being having this earthly experience. And, and I say, yeah, but great. But you know, can you uh, congregate together with other people that, that share your, your view of the world? Can you, uh, if you're you know, in a coma somewhere or your health isn't optimal or you're throwing up somewhere, I mean, can you really you know, go to prayer or go to meditation or whatever it is that's your spiritual practice? 
Again, I'm thinking the answer is probably no, you can't enjoy your sense of spiritual connection as well uh, when you don't have your health. People say their friends are quite important to them. And again, similar as family. Can you enjoy your friends if you don't have your health? The answer to me is probably not as much or not at all. People say, well, my mental faculties, my ability to read and study and think, well, that, that's, like, that's very, very important to me. And I say, well, yeah, but again, can you do that to your peak ability if you don't have your health? And I believe the answer is no. People say, well, I love to run and jump and play. And again, obviously, you can see the trend I'm going with here, gang, right? That if you uh, can't run and jump and play and express your physical essence to the world, well, then, you know, you're probably not able to enjoy your physicalness as well either. So again, uh, the last one here in my hologram of life vision is financial. And certainly people uh, value, you know, it helps make the world go round. There's a purpose to money and it's a, a way to celebrate your contribution to humanity and stuff. But most of us, if we don't work, we don't get paid, right? And again, people say, well, I'm going to retire someday and enjoy my money and travel and stuff. But can you do that if you don't have your health, right? So my offering for your consideration tonight is this whole concept of health is actually like a super important concept. And I would offer that it is the cornerstone or the linchpin or the center of the entire hologram of your life. Nothing else in your life is going to work as well or at its peak without your health. So if, if, that, if you're following along with my thinking here and it resonates, then you realize this concept of health is, is pretty important. So I would offer then like, well, maybe we should, you know, define health. Like, well, you know, what is health? How do we actually define what that is? And, and you know, quite frankly, what, is, what isn't it? And then, you know, part of the mission of tonight is, you know, and where does chiropractic fit into all of that? Well, I'm glad you're asking the questions that I'm about to answer. So let's go to the World Health Organization, who apparently thinks they know something about health. And we could debate that over a nice glass of wine some night. But for tonight, let's just go with one of the pieces straight off their website. One of their founding principles is part of a definition of health. They say this way, health is a state of complete, and that's the word I really want you to hang on to here, complete physical mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmities and by the way if you can see me looking left a little bit it's because i have a giant screen here that's actually presenting the slide so i apologize if, I, if i'm not distracted i'm actually looking at the slide so again let's read that a health is a state of complete physical mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity now i can tell you in my community i've been kicked out of no less than three medical practices fired by my medical doctor <laughs> And when I'm, I'm quizzed as to why, they say, well, you never come. And I say, well, yeah, but you tell me that you only want to see me when I'm sick. And I don't get sick very often, like slash almost never. So, but because I'm not there often enough, you only want me to go when I'm sick, which, which the World Health Organization clearly states is not really the definition of health. It's not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. It's a complete state, which we need to go into defining what that means. But then, anyways, these docs would just, you know, basically toss me and go, oh, we never see enough. I don't have any record and you don't know anything about you. So I'm just, I don't want the aggravation. I'm like, okay, see ya, right? I would offer this, you guys, that I want to expand on this definition a little bit. I think it's quite a good definition, but I want to expand on it just a little wee bit, okay? So this is Dr. Tom's holistic definition of health. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, social, spiritual, career, family, and financial well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in any of these areas. So in other words, just because um, there isn't any disease or infirmity in your financial life doesn't necessarily mean that you are in a state of complete health there. You know, just because your spouse, um, you know, hasn't hit you with the uh, separation or divorce papers yet doesn't necessarily mean that your, you know, relationship is in an optimal state of well-being. Right. Just because your neighbor hasn't put up a 12 foot high privacy fence with the Rottweilers doesn't necessarily mean, which I would offer would be a symptom of a not a great social situation, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a complete state of social well-being. And vis-a-vis, -vis, it doesn't mean that just because you, you don't have any symptoms that you are as in a complete state of physical well-being or mental well-being or spiritual well-being or anything else right so this to me uh, really gives us a, a broad stroke brush to really go in and look at what it means to to live in a complete state of health and well-being okay so let's have a look at some examples is it i mean again if we go back to what the world health organization said and then i just expanded upon a little bit it's not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in any of these areas. So, so let's go in and say, like, do pain and symptoms, do, they, they do not mean that we're unhealthy, right? So let's have a look at uh, workouts. Um, I'm, 
somewhat of an athlete. <laughs> Let's be clear, somewhat is a good operative word there. But if you go and do a workout that you haven't done for a while or you're cross training in a different uh, sport or something like that, it's very common in my experience to be stiff and sore after. So if someone said, you know, are you healthy? And we equated how we felt with health. And if we didn't want to feel crappy or stiff or sore, that people have it in their head that that's, you know, that if you're stiff and sore or not feeling well, that you must be unhealthy, well, then you would never work out. And I think most people, without going into too much detail, would know that exercise is one of the key ingredients to a healthy uh, life. So again, this is just one example of several I want to share with you. What about vomiting? I'll tell you a story. My cousin Cindy got married years ago, and uh, we were looking uh, sort of house sitting our aunt's house while she was traveling the world. And um, my wife uh, and I went to the wedding and I'll give you a little hint. You go to a wedding where there's like a buffet table laid out and there's salmon laid out. It's got like a little glaze on it. Don't eat it. It's probably not great. Okay. So my wife Shelly ate some of this salmon and within uh, a few hours, she wasn't feeling the best. We decided to leave the celebration a bit early. We went home and for the next nine hours, she was like something out of a horror movie. She was projectile vomiting across the room. Blah, every like literally every 15 to 20 minutes and we're talking projectile i mean i don't want to gross you out but i'm talking like 8 to 12 to 15 foot you know projectile vomiting right so if somebody said okay wait you don't feel well you must not be healthy then they would be in this case dead wrong because the wrong thing to do in that example would be to leave the toxins inside your body let them ferment and you get sicker or possibly even expire right so again how you feel and how healthy you are not, not necessarily correlated at all, okay? Fever is another classic one, right? You definitely do not wanna let a fever run unattended, that's for sure. But if you look at the stats from the CDC, they're talking about fevers that are in excess of, a, of 102, like up into the 104, 105 range. You definitely don't wanna leave a fever running there for long, right? But as you ever studied fever, and what it is, most people don't feel well when they have a fever, particularly children. But I can tell you from uh, studying this for years, the physiology behind fever is actually a, uh, um, it's the innate wisdom of the body that's turning the heat up, right? Turning the thermostat up because for every degree Fahrenheit, you turn the thermostat up in the human body. You double the speed with which the NK cells, the natural T killer cells, which are part of the innate immune system, not the acquired immune system, the innate immune system, you double the speed with which they, they move and attack the invaders. So by repressing a fever, you're actually working against innate wisdom of the body. Its natural response is to turn up the heat so that you can speed up the immune system response and fight the invader. And yet we've been taught because we think that health is how you feel, we've been taught to try and always take a fever down. Not wise, not wise, not wise. Okay, so does that mean that if you don't have pain and symptoms that you're healthy? Well, let's have a look at some examples here, heart disease. Sadly, there's no mechanism in your body right now, there's no person in this room, in this Zoom room, including me, that can tell me whether in fact their arteries are wide open or like 40% occluded. There's no mechanism in your body to tell you that. And sadly for Canadians, um, for um, a third of all Canadians, the first warning sign they're gonna have of occlusion of the arteries is a heart attack. And up to 40% of those Canadians don't survive the first heart attack. So in other words, the first symptom you get of occlusion of the arteries is death. Well, that seems a bit severe, but that's actually the dynamics of the physiology, right? So again, you could be feeling great, but, if, but you could still have occlusion of your arteries, the main arteries in your heart. Would you say that if you had even 10% or 20% or 30% occlusion of the arteries, would you say that you're in a complete state of health based upon the WHO's definition? I would say no, right? So again, you can feel great and still not be 100% healthy. What about cancer? My friends in the oncology departments tell me that for most people before they ever feel the symptoms of a uh, accelerated growth of a series of cells in whatever organ system, which we commonly refer to as cancer, usually it's 11 to 14 years of growth before you ever feel any symptoms. So again, uh, one of the things that I've been saying for years is that the human body actually has cancer several times throughout your lifetime, but your body recognizes non-self, attacks it, destroys it, and you get on with your life. I've been laughed at in certain presentations saying that thing. And I was quite vindicated when Johns Hopkins came out with some research about six years ago that said basically the same thing. 
So again, we could all have some form of cancer cells right now and not know it because we don't feel bad. So uh, what I'm trying to do is dispel this myth, gang, that how you feel, it means you're healthy or not healthy, or if you don't feel good, you are healthy. Well, no, wait, you can be vomiting, and that's a healthy response. You get a fever, that's a healthy response, right? Let's do, uh, do one more here. Classic dental caries, right? Cavities. Again, you don't go from, you know, not brushing, flossing, regularly eating all kinds of sugars and stuff like that to, you know, that doesn't happen overnight that you end up with a cavity. It's a process that takes years, right? So again, no pain, no pain, no pain, no pain, and all of a sudden, owie, right? But if you follow the definition, would you be optimally healthy or in a complete state of physical health if you have a tooth that's half rotten just because it's not creating symptoms? I say no. I say no. All right, so let's get into this concept of threshold because let's use the example of the dental carry. So you have a tooth that's healthy, and then there's a situation or a condition where it starts to move in the direction of lack of health or dis hyphen ease, a state of less than the fullest amount of ease of the tooth, using this example, okay? And then finally, you reach a point of threshold where all of a sudden the tooth is like, hey, I'm in trouble here, and um, I'm going to like, like rot out and fall out of your head, and maybe you won't be able to eat your steak dinner if you don't do something about this, so I'm going to tell you that, so I'm going to send a pain message. Right? It's telling you that there's something wrong, there's something going on that you need to pay attention to. But it has to cross a certain threshold before you ever feel that. Just like a glass, you know, you're filling a glass out of a pitcher, you're filling a glass and you put your first drop of water in, followed by many others, and then you get to the point where finally you overcome the, let's use the example of an eight ounce tumbler, the threshold for volume for the eight ounce tumbler, and now you have, you know, water flowing over and, you know, using my two-year-old grandson's, we have mass pa, mass, mass, we have mass. <laughs> so here's my question. Which drop of water is more important? The first drop of water that started the process, even though there was no symptoms? Was it someone in the middle? Was it the, the last drop of water? Or was equal, every drop of water equal? Because they all played a role. Well, I don't know how you feel about that, but from my perspective, every drop of water in this example of filling a glass, it, it plays an equal role. The last drop of water that finally surpassed the volume of threshold, to me, is no more or less important than any other ones. What you'd want to do in this example is have an awareness that you're filling the glass and then see if there isn't something you could do to minimize it or reverse it, okay? Because now we're starting to talk about a complete state of physical, mental, social, career, family, and, and financial well-being, okay? So the concept of threshold is a very important one to think about when we start to think about health, and we start to think about health promotion, not just disease prevention, we're gonna talk about. It. Okay, so where does health come from? What is this thing, what is this, this, this mixture of health? And I'm gonna shine the laser beam on a couple of really focused areas here because of the time constrictions we have tonight. I, I don't have time to go into a you know, a three hour doctoral dissertation. So we're gonna sort of narrow it down specifically and talk a lot about it from a chiropractic perspective because that's part of our purpose tonight. So I wanna make sure that people are aware of this. This is like day one. I have a brother who's a medical doctor. I got a dear friend who's a dentist. Uh, you obviously, I went to, to chiropractic school. And this is like day one in anatomy or physiology class, right? That the body is a self-regulating, self-maintaining, self-healing homeostatic organism. Right. All the healthcare professions, basically, you know, day one or two, there's some version of that that's read out of either, you know, guidance physiology or, you know, Gray's Anatomy, which, by the way, there actually is a Gray's Anatomy, not just the, uh, the sitcom or the, uh, the show. OK, we talk about an inborn or innate within intelligence in the body that coordinates the function of every organ, gland and system in the body to allow it to maintain itself and return to homeostasis. OK, now, can you get a cup full of this intelligence? Can you weigh it? Can you measure it? Can you quantify it? Well, it would be like trying to get a cup full of someone's like uh, IQ or EQ, right? It's not something that's quantifiable from that way, but just because it's not quantifiable doesn't mean that it's any less real. Uh, and the classic example of that is the is two cells coming together to form uh, a new child. Like our, our granddaughter Hattie is six days old. She was over for family dinner tonight with with her family. And it's just amazing to me that two little, you know, uh, haploid cells can come together and create that incredible being, you know, almost nine months later. It's incredible. So 
how does this happen? How do we maintain this homeostasis? How do we create self healing self regulation? It's largely, not exclusively, but largely accomplished by our nerve system, communicating from the brain to the tissue cells, and then tissue cells communicating back to the brain, what they call like a, an old safety pin cycle. And the old safety pins used to you know, hold kids' diapers up and stuff, right? To increase or decrease the flow of energy in the cell organ gland to allow it to adapt to the stressors of daily living. Because we are constantly being um, uh, bombarded, if you will, to use a a bit of a, a, a stronger word, by the stresses of life, right? Whether it's the, the mild stress of gravity or whether it's the, uh, you know, the, the quality of the food we're eating or the quantity of water we're drinking or the air we're breathing or the people that are nipping at our heels and barking, you know, directions and commands at us at work. I mean, whatever it is, we're constantly bombarded with information from a lot of different categories. And it's our nerve system's job to coordinate all of that and increase or decrease energy flow to different organs, glands, and systems in order to allow us to adapt to the stresses of daily living, okay? And I already talked about this, but this is my little, uh, one of my grandsons here, Lincoln. Um, he was born about 12 weeks ago. Apparently his mom just uh, had him weighed yesterday. A little guy at 12 weeks is already almost 15 pounds. You know, I mean, a lunker, this kid. I said, I said, Tess, this kid can't be the only 100 pounder in first grade. I mean, <laughs> come on, right? So again, this inborn intelligence has the ability to go and allow that to happen. Has the ability to be digesting the tuna steak I had tonight while it's circulating blood, while I'm speaking, while I'm digesting the food, while I'm pumping blood, while I'm doing oxygen exchange. I mean, all of the many billions and trillions of activities that go on on a moment by moment basis, there's a matrix of intelligence that helps allow that all to happen. And the nerve system is the coordinating vessel sending messages to and from the nerve system, to, through the nerve system to the brain and to the tissue cells and back, right? So again, this is uh, physiology, you know, again, Gray's Anatomy 101, day one of any healthcare school. Nervous system is the major controlling regulatory and communicating system in the body. It's a center of all mental activity, including thought, learning, and memory. Together with the endocrine system, the nervous system is responsible for regulating and maintaining homeostasis, right? It gets a bit warm in here while I'm presenting, right? My body's going to do what it can. It's going to uh, open up some of the capillary beds. It's going to let some of the heat out of the core of my body. It's going to allow me to possibly perspire. It may increase my heart rate a little bit and my stroke volume to get the blood more to the periphery. I mean, there's all of these things that it's doing on a second by second basis. So I would offer, and this is... So if you haven't seen um, this, by the way, sorry for that, folks, I just got invited to another conversation and I'm quite happy in this one. So um, this is a, just a sort of a brief schematic of some of the different uh, aspects of the central nervous system and the different organ systems and stuff, you know, that it goes to. Okay. So let's have, let's take this and, and just sort of do a, a bit of a, a, a review of some of the things I was just talking about. Okay. So again, I've often said we're constantly adapting the physical, mental, emotional, and biochemical uh, world around us and within us. So don't forget the nervous system isn't just looking at the world outside, it's also looking at the world inside. And one of the things, for example, it really needs to keep an eye on is the acid base balance in our body. And if our pH starts to wander towards the acidic side, well, it'll do a lot of things to, to, to base alkalize us in order to fight against that acidic state because our body gets, uh, you know, below about 7.2 in the pH scale and man, all kinds of bad stuff happens. So, you know, one of the things that my, a couple of my daughters were dealing with um, with their uh, pregnancies were they were dealing with like charlie horses, right? Well, this is a common way that the body actually deals with that acidic state of protein synthesis in the, in the you know, procreation of a child is that it will actually pull um, positive ions out of the blood. And one of some of the easiest ones to go to are the things that would be involved in, in muscle movement. Right, so it'll go in and grab the potassium and sodium and or calcium ions to you know balance the pH. But the body without those will actually create a muscle contraction, and you get the you know what's coming for it as a Charlie horse. But it's all understandable because it's 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 reading the internal you know pH biochemistry of the body. Okay. Some stress sources we encounter are greater than our body's ability to adapt. So I talked about the brief, gentle pull of, you know, gravity here as I'm standing, you know, sharing some thoughts with you guys, right? That's absolutely not a problem. If I even went outside and I jumped off a chair and the force of gravity brought me down, that's probably okay. 
if I got up on top of the garage roof and jumped off, I mean, force of gravity still, you know, having an impact on me, but that's a stress force that might be greater than my body's ability to adapt to, right? For sure, if I jumped off the top of my home, <laughs> that would definitely be an input of physical stress that would be greater than my body's ability to adapt to. So we do encounter both in our physical, mental, emotional, and our biochemical world stress forces that are right on the edge of our comfort zone, so to speak, right? So it's, you know, you might have a discussion with your uh, partner that, you know, is okay. It's mildly stressful, but it's not a big deal. You get into a downright screaming match. It's like, that might be more than our ability to adapt. So what's the body's, what's, how does the body deal with this? How does the body uh, help us adapt to that, right? As a protection mechanism, we, to use an electrical analogy, we blow a circuit. Much like, again, I've got, as I said, I've got five daughters. Uh, I can tell you the days of like curling irons and straighteners and hair dryers. And, and I begged them, I said, don't plug them into the same circuit, girls, or you're going to lose it all. And usually they were okay, but occasionally they weren't. And so if you plug all that stuff in and you draw too much juice through the circuit, that basically the, the, the logic is I'm heating up the system and I can either burn the house down or I can just trip the breaker switch and make those things not work. Well, that's basically the same wisdom the body has. It's a crude analogy, but it does have some applicability here because in our nerve system, the job of the nerve system is to make us aware of our environment, reading internally, externally, as I've, I've been stating all along, right? And it's a, when you blow a circuit, it's, it's letting you know that you've encountered a stress force that's greater than your body's ability to adapt to. So think about the prime directive in biology. Prime directive in biology is survival of the species. So anything that could risk our survival as a species, i.e. a stress force that's going to take us out, right? Well, obviously, if we surpass the stress force right off the bat and get taken out of the gene pool, I mean, we can't learn from that. But if the stress force is a, greater than our body's ability to adapt, but not a cataclysm event to take us out of the gene pool, we need to learn from that. So the nerve system is a teaching tool, will blow the circuit breaker, let us know that we've surpassed our threshold for adaptation. It's basically behavior mod 101, right? So we don't do that again or foolishly do an amplified version of that and take ourselves out of the gene pool, thus, you know, basically contravening the, the sacred first directive in biology, which is survival of the species, okay? However, the blown circuit in the nerve system we refer to in chiropractic as a subluxation. Kind of sounds like a subway station, okay? And if you break the word down uh, into its component parts, the prefix sub means less than or under. The term lux refers to a unit of lighter energy. And ation means a condition of. So if you take the word subluxation, it's a condition of less than the fullest amount of lighter energy flowing through the body, or in this case, that particular nerve tract, okay? What happens though is the, the absolutely life-giving energy that the nerve system supplies to the end stage muscles or organs or glands or cells, now that's not the same. And the cycles of um, apoptosis that the body's going through to repair damaged cells and make them strong again, which probably most of you are aware of, that there's going to be uh, somewhere in the range of 73 trillion cells are gonna be replaced in your body today right? So our body's going through this all the time. The nerve system is directly responsible for that process occurring. So if the nerve system energy is less to that organ gland or system, then that organ gland or system is going to be weakened. You're going to have damaged cells that can't be replaced to repair it. And now we're, still, now we're in, uh, in trouble because now that weakened body part are more prone or susceptible to injury, illness, or disease injury, illness, or disease because of the weakened state. Now it's all part of the evolutionary pathway of the human mechanism, the human species, but it actually, if the circuit breaker isn't turned back on, now we've got a problem, okay? So now a stress force that would not like to have caused us any harm can overwhelm the weakened tissue, leading to a cry for help that we interpret as pain or symptoms. And as the most common analogy in the natural health world, people say all the time, is the problem the smoke alarm or is the problem what's caused the smoke alarm to go off? And I would offer it's the thing that's caused the smoke alarm to go off, which is the fire that's about to burn your house down and cause damage or, or sadly maybe hurt somebody or kill somebody, right? So just turning the alarm off to me isn't the wisdom. You got to go to the source. So again, if you understand the process on, a, on a, like a 35,000 foot view, like I just described, and you understand that the symptoms or pain is the end result, it's not the problem. It's the, it's, it's, the, it's the end result of the problem where the body is now crying for help saying, hey, I'm in a weakened state. I need some support here. 
because I'm going to be more susceptible to, you know, injury, illness, and disease. You know, you know there's so many people who think chiropractors have got something to do with low back pain. And apparently it's something that, you know, chiropractors can definitely have an impact on. I used to joke with patients all the time. I'd say, you know, the only reason that I, I, I access your spine is because it's my easiest and most direct way to get to your nerve system. If I could access your nerve system easier through your hair, I'd be a hairstylist, right? Because what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm keeping that nerve system function at its optimal rate so that you can adapt optimally, subject to your genetic potential. There is a thing called genetics that does play a role. It's so subject to your genetic potential. You can be the best version of self that you can be. And that's really what a chiropractic adjustment is designed to do, okay? It's, we, we turn the blown bracket circuit back on using a chiropractic adjustment, which has a constructive impact on the nervous system that allows it to better adapt to the stressors of the environment, both internally and externally. The weakened cell structure now get a chance to start to get stronger. You get damaged cells that get replaced through the process of apoptosis, and now you have the tissue less prone to injury, illness, and disease, right? And, you know, I, I can tell you a story. I had a um, family. He was the local um, fire department chief. His wife was a social worker, and they had two, two kids. And uh, it was in, like, late spring, sort of probably just a little bit earlier than this time of year that we, where this particular thing's being presented in, in early June. And... Um, it was the love family. So Grant comes in to me and uh, we're having a conversation about his health and well-being. And he goes, by the way, I thought I'd just let you know that you passed. I said, I passed? I didn't, I didn't, know, I was, I didn't know there was a quiz. <laughs> and he says, no, no. He says, you, you educated me and told me about the anatomy and physiology of the nerve system and what chiropractic should really do. So he says, you were under test this entire year. He said, do you know that this is the first year where my wife, I, and both of my children have never missed a day of work or a day of school? He said, because we were able to adapt to the stress forces of our life. We didn't get into a weakened state. And so the bugs that have always been present, we've always missed days or weeks of school or, or work every year. We were able to adapt to that more successfully. We never missed a day. So he says, you've passed. And if it's okay with you, I would like me and my family to stay under your care for the rest of our lives. Is that okay with you? I'm like, yeah, I'm cool with that, right? <laughs> so again, the goal, you guys, is to be able to adapt to the environment, right? A more adaptive nervous system allows the human body self-healing self-regulating, self-maintaining systems to operate to the best of their ability, giving the body the opportunity to heal from any disease that it has created in its less adaptive state. That's really the big picture here of human evolution. And in this case, uh, our purpose, my purpose as a chiropractor, okay? Here's a little picture of our little um, grandson who's now 12 weeks. He's uh, hours old at this point. And uh, my two-year-old grandson, so I have a two-year-old, almost two-year-old, a 12-week-old, and a six-day-old as of this recording. And uh, one of the things that I can give them is to check their nerve systems for the accumulated stress of the birth process to see if, in fact, there's been any, you know, blown circuits. Because any of you that have had children, you know, it can be a traumatic experience, whether it's a vaginal or a C-section birth. And my wife had both in, in our five children. And uh, all of my children were checked. I've checked uh, over 130 newborn babies when their first minutes to hours of life, and all but two of them had blown circuits or what we call subluxations from the birth process. So we know Abraham Taubman's research all the way back in the 1960s showed that 85% of all children born in Western culture were subluxated from the birth process. So whether it's the cramped space in the womb or it's the delivery or the tugging and pulling or whatever, it can be quite a traumatic process. She took these two pictures about two seconds apart, and I love this because Link seems to be very focused here, but literally within a second and a half, he's starting to smile. It was the first smile of his young life, and uh, I was quite honored uh, by that. And Link was, in fact, subluxated from the birth process. So let's go back and sort of uh, bring this thing in for a bit of a landing here, so we got some time for q and I would offer this. As we started earlier, health, we said, is important. There's lots of other important things in life, but if you don't have your health, you can't enjoy your family. You can't enjoy your work. You can't make money to the degree that you could. You can't enjoy your jumping, running, playing physically or your mental well-being or even your connection to source or spirit, right? So I would offer it's a complete state of all of those aspects of the hologram of life and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in any of these areas. And hopefully I was giving you several examples of how you can have symptoms and not feel well but be actually quite healthy and quite the opposite is true you can feel great and not have uh to be in a you know in a complete state of health and well-being so let's talk about this thing uh complete state of health what does that mean the question that begs to be asked from my perspective is 
what is life supposed to be like for human beings? Right? Is it just one damn thing after another relative to health? Or is there another way to do it? So one way to do it is to live a life of quiet desperation where you're just always worried about what illness, injury, disease is coming our way and not living a rich, full life because we live in fear of what's around the next corner. We actually either haven't been educated about the power of our innate intelligence and the nerve system that helps control and coordinate the self-regulating, self-healing, self-homeostatic mechanisms in the body, or... We haven't had a chance to get any of the blown circuits, the subluxations corrected. And so as a result of that, we're not adapting properly. And, you know, we're just subject to every little bug going around. Um, my wife has uh, dear friends, or we have some dear friends, and uh, literally it's a family of four. They're the sickest people I've ever met. doesn't matter what bug's going around, they get it, right? And, of course, they blame it on the bug. But, like, we live in the same environment. We interact with them a lot, and we don't get sick. Because if it was just the bugs gang, then everybody they came in contact with it would get sick. So it's not just the bugs. The germ theory is incomplete if people think it's just the bugs. It's about the host and how it interacts with that and whether it can adapt, right? So another way to think about this are, is, it, is the human uh, journey to just live life fully, enjoying all the fruits of our labor, knowing our innate intelligence is on the job and allowing it to adapt its fullest potential via an optimally functioning nerve system. We provide that inborn intelligence with great resources because, again, you can have the, the best intelligence on the planet, but if you're not given great resources to work with, like, again, optimal rest, exercise, hydration, nutrition, and stress management, just to name some important ones. There's lots of others, but those are some good tools or substrates for the innate intelligence to work with. If you don't give it that to work with, it isn't going to get a chance to adapt to its fullest level. The end result, if you do, you have a complete human being able to fulfill their purpose and potential and contribute to society in a meaningful and helpful way. Health promotion versus disease prevention. Some people think that that is the same thing, and I disagree. I think that they are related cousins, but they're, you're not going quite far enough down the spectrum for all you're thinking about is disease prevention, right? You can work towards preventing disease and still not live life as fully and richly as your genetic potential. Again, we all have genetic potential, gang. I am not going to be black skinned because it's not part of my genetic potential right? I'm never going to be seven foot six tall. It's not part of my genetic potential, right? So certainly genetics plays a role relative to uh, certain aspects of how we express our phenotype to the world, but it certainly isn't the only thing, right? And the nerve system, as I'm hopefully able to uh, help you uh, appreciate, affirm, or understand, is really the key to allowing us to adapt to the, to the world that we live in and live the richest, fullest life subject to our genetic potential. So, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Eat, laugh, play, Party if that's your thing, right? But you don't have to pay the negative consequences, you know, to that, right? So again, I want to emphasize you can, in disease prevention, you can work towards preventing disease and still not live life as richly and fully as your genetic bench will allow because you have not maximized your range of adaptation, right? When you're in health promotion, so when you focus on providing the best environment and substrates or tools, I'm just showing a handful of them here, rest, exercise, nutrition, hydration, stress management, for the innate intelligence within to allow you to adapt to the widest range of possibilities your genetic potential will allow. And I want to close with a story. This little girl was a practice member of mine. Um, the time of this particular story, she was uh, about three and a half years old. And her and her family are under regular uh, adaptive nerve system, well, what we call wellness care, health promotion care, uh, uh, helping promote the highest state of well-being that they could be relative to an optimally functioning nerve system and the other things that substrates that I talked about. Okay, But this little girl was sick and she had been on and off sick for several months and her mom couldn't quite get like, just what the cause was because you know, she would be literally fine in the morning and she'd go off to school happy or you know, preschool all happy and smiles. And then literally, uh, sometimes by lunchtime or, or certainly by the afternoon, she'd come back and she'd be wheezy and her chest would be congested. And a couple of times it had just gone re really rapidly within a matter of a day or two, like into her bronchioles and one time even into her lungs in what would have been classed as like a pneumonia because there was, you know, fluid in her lungs. But it was happening quickly. And I was working with this family, so mom would bring the kid in to get checked, her nerve system checked, and every time I checked her, her nerve system was off pattern, and we'd correct the subluxations, the circuit breakers that were blown. But what we couldn't figure out was what was blowing the circuit breakers, because that's quite unusual for a three-and-a-half-year-old child, okay? 
So at one point uh, I was over at the house actually checking this kid because again, she was sick and I'd been monitoring her vitals because she was not doing well at all. She was laying on the couch. Um, she was relatively listless for her particular energy. Um, but she wasn't like, you know, completely down and out. She had a very high, very high uh, respiration rate. Matter of fact, she was having indrawing between her ribs. If you've ever seen a little kid with indrawing between the ribs because they're fighting so hard to get oxygen, it's a, it's a scary thing. Um, she also had her uh, heart rate elevated. Her body was, 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 was definitely working hard. But what's an important thing in pediatric, or all health, but particularly pediatrics, is to monitor vitals. So I was monitoring her vitals and they weren't getting worse. And... Um, there was actually a, a, a family friend, the kid's uncle was a medical doctor. And so uh, he was called over to check this kid out and he checks this kid out and he says, you know what, this kid is very sick. She's got like fluid in her lungs. We call it a bilateral lobar pneumonia. He said she needs to be in ICU. She needs to be in an oxygen tent. She needs to be on steroids. Like this kid is really sick. And I looked at the mom and I said, you know, what do you want to do? We're like four minutes from the hospital. If, if this is truly, you feel it's like a, a medical emergency. And uh, we talked about it and uh, she says, well, what do you think? And I said, well, we can be at the hospital in four minutes. So if this is truly a medical emergency and her vitals start to get worse, certainly we could have her there quickly. But I said, I think this kid has an innate intelligence within her body that wants to express itself fully. And if I can keep her connected to that innate intelligence, this kid can go from what the medical doctors label as bilateral lobar pneumonia and indra and it's, you know, an un unwell child into a healthier child. And I said, I'm willing to stay and, and, and help validate or prove that. And she goes, you're on. So I stayed and I checked this child every hour on the hour, gang, for 28 hours. I checked her for blown circuit breakers, for maladaptation of nervous system every hour. Set an alarm, I'd get up, I'd check her. And she, she needed to be adjusted, chiropractic adjusted 24 of those 28 times. And I was so exhausted by the end of the 28th hour that I just was in a coma. I actually sort of slept through my alarm. And I woke to this little girl nudging me, sleeping on the bed and saying, Daddy, can I go to school now? This is my three and a half year old daughter, Tegan. It's our middle child. She went from bilateral over pneumonia with crazy heart rates, like way up in the 160s, uh, in dry and respirations, you know, in the 90 to 100 range to in 28 hours saying, can I go back to school? Chiropractic is not the treatment of bilateral lobar pneumonia anymore. It's the treatment of headaches or low back pain. Chiropractic is the treatment of human beings to allow them to express their fullest potential to the world and increase the range of adaptation that they have to life and to the stressors, both internally and externally. That does not mean that you, don't, you, you shouldn't be eating good nutrition. You shouldn't be breathing clean air and drinking clean water and managing your stress and getting proper rest and, and many other things that people know in the holistic natural health world, they're good for health. It doesn't mean that you maybe shouldn't be taking supplementation or vitamins and other things. It's not saying any of that. The job of chiropractic, in my opinion, is to detect and release nerve system interference, subluxation we call it, to allow that nerve system and that human being to adapt to their greatest ability so they can express their fullest genetic potential to the world and live a rich, full, fulfilled, prosperous, life contributed to humanity based upon their spiritual purpose for being here on the planet in the first place. That's the purpose of chiropractic in my opinion. And that's what I've dedicated my entire life to. Thanks so much for taking some time to be here with us. Uh, Neda, I, I take a little pause and a deep breath, maybe a glass of water, and uh, I'm very open to any and all questions that uh, people may have to, to ask. What a great talk that was, informative, fun, Inspiring, thank you, that was so good. So yes, please, um, if you do have questions, just use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and we would love to answer them. I'm seeing uh, oh, a couple of people I know, actually, Heather Lynn and Dottilio here. Hi, Heather Lynn, nice to uh, hear from you in the chat, not in the, uh, in the other part. So that's great. I'd love though, if there are any questions in the Q&A, that would be fantastic. Nobody ever seems to want to go first, so we'll ask who wants to go second, Nada, maybe, right? <laughs> well, we have a comment. Health is wealth, something we have learned over these current times. This is true. Wise words. 
No questions about that. If you do not have your health, what have you got, right? So That's true. For sure. And thank you, Dr. Tom. It was, a, it was great information. Thank you so much. Thanks a ton, Dr. Tom. Really enjoyed the webinar. That's super. You're welcome, Curtis. And uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but I'll say Alaha. Um, that's super. Well, we do have a, it looks like there might be a couple of questions coming in. Later. Yeah. So can chiropractic help with eye disease? Uh, for example, glaucoma. Hmm, great question. Um, again, my offering is that chiropractic is not the treatment of any, any disease, but the treatment of human beings. And some human beings have glaucoma and there's many causes for glaucoma. But I would say this, that um, the range of adaptation of the human body to maintain, you know, it's, 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 it's homeostasis and stuff. Um, is it possible that through, if there were no subluxations, then chiropractic could be of no value, in my opinion. Okay, from a, from a purely the way I presented the, the conversation tonight. But I, my, my wife's family has a history of glaucoma. And it's interesting that my wife is the only one in her family who's not expressing any of the symptoms of glaucoma. And she's the only one in her family who's under regular chiropractic care. First 300 times I saw things like that, I thought they were coincidences. Now I think there might be a pattern developing, right? So again, if you look at the range of adaptation and what the causes are, I would not say for sure that the chiropractic is a treatment of glaucoma. No, I would not say that. Would I say that a human being who has glaucoma could benefit from chiropractic care to increase the range of adaptation, to allow them to be the best version of self they could be? Yeah, I would say for sure that, that, would, that is true. The other thing I love about most of the natural health things is, is I know you're a big advocate as well, Nada, um, to get in chiropractic, is it, at least, it can't hurt you, right? And so if it's not necessarily gonna help with that specific thing, I mean, I had a practice members who had um, all kinds of things from like psoriasis to shingles to all kinds of different things that they'd wrestled with for years that suddenly weren't there anymore. It wasn't why they necessarily came to see me. It was a nice byproduct of their body being at a higher range of adaptation. The other thing I said poorly a couple of times then is that, you know, I got eight women pregnant in my practice. <laughs> Not the right way to say that, but I had women with infertility issues who were able to conceive after they get under care. And that's also a, a great joy. So uh, I don't know if I answered that question directly, but, but indirectly, I think I did. Okay, you did. Thank you. Uh, from Don in Nanaimo. Hi, Don. Can the body increase lost bone? So I guess lost bone mass? Again, it would depend upon the, uh, the, the, the reason behind it. But I mean, one of the biggest causes of osteoporosis or, or loss or osteopenia to loss of bone mass is the lack of activity. One of the reasons people don't move is because they don't function well or they don't move well or they hurt when they move. So again, I would say you increase someone's range of adaptation and give them their functional mobility back so that they can actually move and do things. It's probable or possible that that could help them, you know, increase their, their bone mass in future. Great, thank you. I have several questions here. Um, okay, is there any Cairo technique we can do with ourselves? I've just moved to a new country and don't have a practitioner here in a tiny village. Wow, what a great question. Um, I, 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 I wish there was something that I was aware of, but I'm, I'm just not aware of anything that we can do for ourselves. Uh, I would love to be able to learn to adjust virtually, but I haven't quite figured out how to, how to do that energetically over a distance. So uh, I'm not that clear. I, I, there is a technique that I learned from the, the god grandfather of, of chiropractic pediatrics, uh, a guy named Larry Webster. Um, and again, I demonstrated it to parents. So if they're in the middle of the night and have a kid who's, who's you know, not, not, not happy and fussing, and it is a kind of a self-adjusting technique because the head is one of the heaviest parts, not the heaviest part of a, but of a child. And so what you can do with a child is very gently, you can lay them on your lap with their head out in front or on their back on your lap. And then you get them underneath their knees and you just flex their knees up like this. And you just sort of kind of hanging upside down like they were in the womb. And you just gently rock them like this. And just, it's literally like a form of long axis traction. And I've had, um, like when I was away speaking somewhere, my wife would do that with our children. And many times it allowed for the subluxation correction, allowed them to go back to sleep and away they go. So I've taught many parents that one. I'm not so sure if there's a human big enough to do that to an adult, but <laughs> I know for children, I've, I've seen some impact in a positive way. Thank you. Um, okay, from Judy, every chiropractor I've gone to over the years uses different techniques. A network chiro simply tap different parts of my body lightly. I usually had a migraine after for a couple of days. 
I did 12 sessions and then quit. Perhaps my migraines were helping to adapt in some way, like a fever. What do you think? Yeah, that's a great question, Judy. And I, I, you know, again, I can't, not having assessed you, it would be improbable for me to say exactly what was going on there. But I will say this, different carpeted techniques um, are, are just that, they're different. And I use a, an entire range from very light, gentle tonal contacts, right, to a very sort of heavy, um, you know, more structural type adjustment. And it's not a one size fits all, you know. Um, there's a technique I learned from a doctor in Dallas, Texas called a crane condyle lift. And when I first started using it on my wife, it was like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Within a couple of years, if I did that, she'd have a pukey migraine headache within 20 minutes every time. So again, it was, the, it was, the, it was, the, it was a great tool. It was just applied in that case, you know, in, incorrectly. So again, I think one of the part of the art, uh, it's also the science of chiropractic is to know for different people, what technique's gonna serve them best. And so Judy, you're very wise in even considering that the adaptive response your body was going through, like the, the, the headache, the migraine was, was part of the healing process. Just like, you know, this, when you're working out, right, you don't notice it, but you're actually tearing your body down and the soreness comes from the repair process. So the, the soreness is that. So it's possible, Judy, but I, I, without actually, you know, being there to assess. I would say if it happened every time for 12 times, I would be concerned that that particular tool maybe wasn't the best tool for you at that particular stage of your life, right? But you're very wise to even consider that, Judy. That's, that's most people don't think out of the box like that. Thanks. Boy, we have a lot of questions here. Uh, type two diabetes, I believe an endocrine issue and chiropractic care thoughts. Again, I'm gonna just keep beating that drum. Chiropractic is not the treatment of any disease, but it's the treatment of people. And people, I've had people with diabetes in my practice, who likely didn't, who, I can't remember anybody coming to me because they had diabetes to see if we could increase the range of adaptation. But I did have several people who found this side effect of increasing the range of adaptation through a more optimally functioning nervous system is that they were able to uh, either change their medication or in two cases, decrease their medication completely or, or get away from it completely because their body was, was, was working differently. That's not the treatment of diabetes. I wouldn't say that, but I would say that your body's ability to adapt is always higher when you have a clear nerve system. So what I would say to people say, you know what, go and get your nerve system checked by a competent chiropractor. And there's some great technologies today from service electromyographs to dermothermography to heart rate variability. There's all kinds of technologies to really assess uh, without um, uh, any sort of invasive sort of testing, very, very easy testing to find out the function. And if, if in my opinion, the nervous system is functioning optimally, chiropractor can't be of any service to you. But the number of times I found that in my career was quite rare. <laughs> I remember I had a guy come in one time, he was a yoga instructor, 27 year yoga instructor, amazing human boy, he was flexible. And his wife was a midwife in the area and she was, and her kids were under care. And so she asked Frank to come in. And so I assessed him and I only found two subluxations, one at the very top of his spine nerve system, and one at the very bottom. And he says, I wondered if you would find that. I can tell in my yoga that I'm, I'm, there's tension there. And I said, you want me to help you with that? And he goes, I, tell, I, I says, I have, a, I have someone I'd like to offer you. I said, great. He says, now that I'm sure where they are, he said, what if I put some really focused effort there for like the next four to six months to see if I can correct them myself? I said, what a great idea. Let's, let's take the challenge. I'll take it on. But please promise me you'll come back. He goes, I'll come back. It took him seven months to come back. We checked him and it was the exact same two blown circuits. So he wasn't able to do it on his own in that case, but we were able to help him adapt to a higher range in that case. So. Excellent. Uh, I think this question might uh, be relevant to the last one too. What do you think about MS? It's a very general question, but your experience. Well, I mean, MS fights, the, you know, uh, is a, a you know a dis hyphen ease of the nerve system, and so lots of causes of it. But again, I, I, I can't say this enough. Chiropractic is not the treatment of any disease, in my opinion, it's treatment of people. And some people have MS, and I've had people in my practice under that had MS that found that it made their symptoms a lot less, right? So now, was that everybody that came in with MS? I can't say, I never did a study to find out if it was everybody, but I knew lots of people that did, right? So it's just like not every woman who was having issues with fertility was able to conceive a child after they got their nerve system corrected, but many did, right? And what I would love to see actually, Nate, is see more research on um, certain, somebody brought it up actually earlier, is are there certain techniques in chiropractic to stabilize the nervous system that actually have a greater impact in certain areas than others. Uh, that research just 
there just isn't enough funding yet to do that kind of stuff, right? But that would be fascinating to me to, to see that kind of research being done uh, based upon the principles that we, that we shared tonight. Right. Any other questions, Nita? One more, we'll take one more. And uh, I think I know the answer to this. And would chiropr a chiropractic session on a regular basis contribute to maintain our well being? <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. If I was able to communicate what I hope to tonight, the, if, if your nerve system is not functioning at peak, you may not feel that because you may not have crossed threshold, but because the nerve system controls and coordinates every organ gland and system in the body, I don't want mine working at 95%. <laughs> I want mine working at 100% all the time. So I get my nerve system checked weekly, at least weekly, just to make sure. And many times it's functioning optimally, so I, I don't need any intervention. But what I'm paying my chiropractor to do is to have the knowledge to know whether they should intervene or not, right? There's an old story taught in, in, in chiropractic. Um, BJ Palmer, who was one of the developers of chiropractic, he, but this is way back in the 1920s when we had, you know, different types of automobiles. But so we had a, a car that was backfiring and wasn't starting properly and stuff. And so we went to a garage. And he says to the mechanic, he goes, you know, this is what's going on. And he goes, well, let me have a look, BJ. So he goes under the hood and he try and start it and listens. And he says, okay, my God, I finally got to go enough, shut it off, try it again, do some different things. And he took a screwdriver out and he adjusted one screw in the carburetor a half turn. And he says, try it now. And vroom, started right up. And he goes, shut it off. Try it again. Vroom, started right up. BJ goes, you're a genius. You corrected it. That's incredible. That's amazing. He says, you fixed my car. It's so great. He says, D -d 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 how much do I owe you? And he goes, well, that'll be $50, which in 1920 would be an absorbent fee. And he goes, $50? All you did was turn a screw a half a turn. He goes, oh, no, no, BJ. Turning the screw a half a turn, that was my gift to you. He says, knowing which screw to turn and how far to turn it, that's what you're paying me the money for. And I often thought that was true of chiropractic too, Nate, right? So you're, not, you're not paying necessarily, in my mind, the chiropractor for, for just what they do, but it's for knowing whether they should do it or not. Are there any contraindications to that? And using the goofy example of the carburetor, which screw to turn and how far to turn it, right? That's what the that's where the, the wisdom and the knowledge comes in. That, in my opinion, is is worthy of of the fee that is charged for the service. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, we've got some lovely comments here. Love the analogy. It's the knowledge, wisdom, and application. Um, Lots of great compliments to you for your, your presentation kind. and your answers. And um, if somebody would like to get a hold of you or get more information about you, where should they go? Oh, great question. Uh, well, they could go to our website. It's kind of a long one, but once you put it in the first time, your cash will take care of it. It is fullcirclecoachingandconsulting.com. Um, and my email at the start of that is just drtom, Dr. Tom at fullcirclecoachingandconsulting.com. So if they have uh, any questions, please just reach out to my, that's my private email, reach out. Or if you kind of forget that, just Google fullcirclecoachingandconsulting.com. And, and uh, if you happen to connect it to North Bay, then you'll know that's our company. And uh, I'd be more than happy to entertain any, you know, any questions or anything that people come up with. Uh, it's a real honor and a privilege to be able to share some thoughts with, with other people, particularly about something I'm so passionate about. So hopefully uh, some of the things I had today might impact some people in a positive way. And help them on their journey in life. And because, uh, you know, in my opinion, we're, we're all here doing the best we can with what we got to work with. And again, subject to our genetic limitations, if we can just all function at the highest level we can, we're gonna lead the most rewarding, fulfilling and productive lives possible. And that's what I've committed my life to helping people understand and helping people achieve. So thanks for the opportunity. And it is a real honor to be able to share some thoughts tonight. Well, just an absolute pleasure. And on behalf of Canadians for Chiropractic, thank you so much. Wonderful Real presentation. Awesome. And Thanks thank again. you everybody for being here. Yes, absolutely. Thank you folks for taking time out of your lives. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye everybody. Okay.